right. Good afternoon. It is officially four o'clock, so we are going to go ahead and get started today um, for our November 18th Education Savings Account Steering Committee. Um, I see some familiar faces on and some new faces too. Um, we've got our steering committee and you can see the agenda is up on uh, on the screen in front of us for today's meeting. And I'm going to go ahead and start by uh, just calling out our committee members and see who's joining us from our committee today. So, um, Alba, have you joined us? See Alba, yeah. Um, Brad, Chaz, Stu, Catherine Walter. I'm here. Hi, Catherine. How are you? Good. Good to see you. All right, Rebecca. Jennifer. Stephanie. Clifton. Hey, Clifton. Jean. Lisa. Robin. Louisa. Hi, I'm here. Hi, Louisa. Good to see you. Hi. Good to see you guys. Amanda. And Sarah. All right. Well, we only have a couple of community members um, for this evening. Um, but Whitney and I will keep an eye on um, the participants as we get more and more participants, it's harder for us to see, but we'll try to keep an eye in. Um, and Catherine and Louisa, if you see um, one of our members jumping in, let us make sure to let me know so I can mark them down here and we can say hello. Um, so as you know, the purpose of the steering committee as it started um, last year was to review and provide feedback on the education savings account implementation. And um, we have uh, just our meeting to give some updates. The program has been implemented. We've gone through one round of applications. Um, we are in our second round of applications. Whitney will give us an update on that in a little bit. Um, but our first uh, uh, topic on our agenda is a litigation update. And we have our staff attorney, Rick Wooten, is here uh, to give uh, any, um, any litigation update, Rick. Well, thank you, Christy. Hello, everybody. We have one small update and timing wise it was funny. It, they issued this, I think, the very day or the next day after our last meeting. The when I was explaining how nothing had happened because the plaintiffs haven't done anything about it ever since they were denied their temporary injunction. But on October 21st, uh, they filed a stipulated scheduling order just to sort of lay the groundwork moving forward. Uh, it gave deadlines for exchanging witnesses and completing discovery. All that, the final date is uh, easy to remember. It's Valentine's Day next year. We have to have all discovery done, including depositions, but the court did not assign a trial date. So we have pre-trial motions that could happen after the discovery is over, no trial date, and no real indication that people are really gearing up for a trial. Um, there, there may be more to come on that once the legislative session begins. And we'll see what happens there. Questions for me about the litigation status. Catherine or Louisa, any committee members have questions? No, thank you. You're okay. welcome. Absolutely. Thanks, Rick. Sure. All right. Um, our next topic is legislation update. 
Rick just alluded to the upcoming legislative session. Um, our legislative liaison, Katie Bloodgood, here at the office wasn't able to join us tonight. But um, as of right now, there are we don't have any um, updates. There is in the draft bills, there is an um, education savings account sort of heading um, in that legislative um, website as there where they put bill drafts as those are coming, but there's no information there. So um, there really isn't more for us to share. But as Katie, um, I think, told you all before, it's, you know, reaching out to your legislators, communicating with your legislators as following up on that. Um, so that's the, the, legis the legislation update. Um, our next update for you is our application update. The application window opened. Oh, Catherine, you had a question. Sorry, didn't mean to go I on. I do. Go ahead. Yeah, go um, ahead. So we don't know if they're going to do anything to address whether or not students that left the public school um, before this went into law can somehow be included going forward. No, we we don't have information on that. You know, and as the OPI, we. We don't have that, but again, that's where you could reach out to your legislators and and make that, you know, share that information with them. Because mm -hmm. I thought of another scenario where kids would be excluded that would be detrimental. If somebody enrolls in the program and then they move, they wouldn't be counted in a school district's ABN funding, and so then they wouldn't be eligible, and that would be... Um, a horrific scenario for a family that enrolls in the program and is doing well and then moves school districts um, that we haven't addressed. Mm -hmm. And if this bill isn't cleaned up like we've been talking mm -hmm. about for a mm -hmm. year. So yeah, nothing. And we, yeah, and, and Catherine, we just haven't seen there. There is no language out there yet. You know, we've um, and so. Um, as far as you know, students moving from district to district, Whitney's been working through some of those issues for students that have been enrolled following what the law says right now. Um, but again, I know that you know there are um, a legislator there. There is a heading. I know they're they're considering some things, and we you know we've you know shared your comments and things as as what we can. We aren't setting those policies though. So, um, but yeah. Um, just dangerous. really keep, yeah, and, you know, keep your legislator, you know, informed and, and that's what, what, what you can do for that. But yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Catherine. Okay. I don't, I don't think I see any other committee member. Okay. All right. All right, Whitney, over to you to give us this application update. Oh, hi, Sue. I see you're on. I'm going to mark you down. Good to see you. Oh, yeah, I just I put a question in the chat. Um, you said that there's a legislation. Um, oh, on the legislative, you... the state legislative page. Uh, let me see what I can find. If not, Sue, I will follow up with you with an email um, from our legislative liaison with that information if I don't find it quickly. OK, thank you. You got it. Go ahead, Whitney. All right. Thank you, Christy. Um, so as you know, we opened our second round of applications on November 1st, and these are going to run through until December 1st. And we've actually had a really good turn turnout so far. Um, we've received a total of 37 applications, which is great. Um, so I've been working with parents uh, directly on if they're missing anything or if their um, application maybe wasn't completed all the way. So I'm just making sure that we're reaching out to make sure they can provide us with everything we need to determine their eligibility. Um, and then at the OPI, we've been reviewing those applications weekly together, and we're hoping to have it everything kind of um, processed a little earlier this round, because we're our goal is to get contracts out to parents uh, mid-December so that we can notify our school districts by January. Um, that way they know which students are enrolled in the program. And so with 13 days remaining, I am expecting to have a higher turnaround this time than the first round, which is great. <laughs> and that's all I have for application updates. So if there's any questions on that, just let me know. <laughs> oh, 
All right, I don't, doesn't look like it. Thanks, Whitney, you're on for the next one, the reimbursement and participation. Uh, oh, Catherine, you have a question. Yeah, I was going to ask really quick, how many of those are reapplies and how many of those are new applications? So, so far we've only had one reapply and then the rest are all new applications. Wow, so 36 yeah. new applications. Yep, it's, wow. a good, it's okay. been a good turnaround. The last time we only had 45 in total for the first round, so like 36 with two weeks still remaining. It's pretty, pretty amazing. So, <laughs> yep. And then I can move on to the reimbursement and participation update. So, Thanks, um, we just got through our third round of ESA reimbursements to our families, which went really well. Um, so far, we haven't had anything that we've had to deny yet for any of our reimbursements. So um, we've reimbursed, I kind of, I want to give a kind of list of what we've reimbursed for, but there's been multiple different educational online programs. We have tuition costs, um, instructional materials and services that we've reimbursed for, and consumable items. And then we've also had a few mileage reimbursement forms come through as well. So um, that's about it for reimbursement updates as well. So if there's any questions on that. <laughs> Still no therapies are being asked to be reimbursed? Not yet, no. I've only okay. had the mileage reimbursement. Um, Just mileage. To travel, yep, two therapies, but and no tutors. Particular. Um, tutoring costs, yes. Okay, so tutors have, have been. Tutoring. Yep. Okay. All right. I think we've had two two families with tutoring costs. So. Mm -hmm. Yep. Great. All right. Well, thanks, Whitney, for You're welcome um, for that update. Um, and now we're on to the communication plan. Um, you've talked about this. Um, for uh, as a committee, we've talked about sharing out the information. It sounds like we've done um, that there has been a lot of communication with the new applications. I think, Whitney, I think we can um, say that that you, the, the message has, has been getting out and um, that your communication plan, I know the one pager that you um, gave feedback to Whitney on sharing that out um, has um, made a difference. We've got, you know, a number of applicants in in our our um, in our applicant pool for for this uh, round of applications. Um, I don't know. I think one of the big um, outcomes of that communication plan was that one pager that you all completed. I think, you know, the meeting before last, perhaps, and then getting that shared out with your uh, with the steering committees um, communities. Um, and so. It, it, seems like that has has really done well you you met that goal that you set for yourselves and so it's exciting to be at this point and and have you all look back at that work and and see the good work that you've done um so that's great are there any other questions or ideas on a communication plan right now Doesn't seem like it. I didn't think so. We'd kind of come to a, a part here where we're we're in the middle of this application window and um, kind of made you made your you made your goal. You made it happen. So that was great work. Um, and I our next agenda item here is just determining um, any next meeting needs. We sort of had this on. Um, on the agenda for last time, and you all definitely wanted to come together here in November, get a feel for the numbers of applications that were coming in um, and uh, see how your communication plan had worked. But now, committee members, what are your thoughts on next meeting um, needs? Would you like to consider uh, reconvening again um, after the holidays as we are, the holidays are upon us, I have to say. Um, Thanksgiving is around the corner um, and then we know the holidays are busy. Um, 
with the steering committee, I know we've just got a couple of members um, on the call this evening, a few of you. Would you like to have a look for a time in January, maybe um, thinking about a time in January to reconvene or maybe even in February where uh, we have a little bit more information? We can give you the, um, Whitney can give you an update on um, the final numbers of any new families that are are in the program. Um, we can look and, and see again if there's any legislative updates. Right now, we're still not seeing anything finalized in that, that bill explorer that I put there um, just yet. But of course, things will be moving along in that regard. Um, thoughts from the committee? I say go I ahead and wait until January, February, and as long as nothing comes up that we don't need to address, then yeah, I don't see a reason for us to meet. Nothing that can't be solved through email. If we need to meet before that, you can send out an email. Send out a message. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I agree. Yeah, I that. agree. We'll we'll that's a good idea. Holiday. I'm sure we all have enough going on that we don't need to <laughs> add another meeting. Unless it is it's that, needed. It's that time of year for sure. Sue, what do you think? Oh, yeah, I agree. Wait till after the first of the year. OK, that sounds great. Well, then what I think I would propose is we'll we'll circle with you all um, and uh, maybe early in January, you'll hear from Whitney about sending out a couple of dates that might work for you. And then for those um, interested, uh, anyone who of our guests today who are watching, we will we will post that time and date here on our education savings account steering committee page on the website. Um, it will try to keep it this time on Monday works pretty well. So it would be probably uh, late January, early February, Monday at four o'clock is what we would we would try for. But we'll make sure to have that posted and plenty of time here on our website for that um, for people who are interested. Um, and anything else from the committee? Any other questions or comments? No, I think this is going very nicely. Thanks, Louisa. It's good to see you. And thanks for thanks for sharing. And thanks for your time and and um, and your work on this committee. Yeah, it's just a privilege to be included. And you know, it's great to be able to share things with my families that they have options. Great. I'm glad to hear that. All right. And if we have any uh, comment on our steering committee's activities uh, from any of our guests, you could raise your hand. Um, let me see. I see a hand up and I think that's Cheryl. Hi, Cheryl. Hi, how are you guys? Doing all right. Good to see you. Good, Good to see you. Um, so congratulations on your 37 applications. It's super exciting. Um, I think that's fantastic. I just had a couple questions about your um, your communications plan and ask um, just to clarify how all you guys have been getting the word out. Um, like, did you post the one pager on your social medias? Um, I did see um, Elsie's uh, email come out just a, as a press release. And then I saw the governor just did a press release last week, which I think was probably really helpful. And then I saw some stuff in the in the news um, following up on, on, I think, the governor's information. Um, but yeah, just wondering how all you've been sharing it, if you had any budget money to put towards advertising or anything like that, like Google ads or anything. No, uh, the committee has no money, <laughs> so we had no money for that. Um, any committee members, do you want, or if you feel comfortable, would you like to share how, if you shared it with your uh, communities or people that you know? Um, I know I can speak for Good Alba day. and I both, that we have been putting the flyer on um, social media, Facebook. We're both of, um, parts of multiple homeschool groups on Facebook, and we've been sharing it in those groups. And I've also been sharing it in special needs groups across Montana for um, parents of special needs children so that if they were thinking about leaving um, public school, that they knew that this was an option available to them. So I know that I've seen posts both for me and from Alba in those groups mm -hmm. and answering questions for anybody who had them. So that's what I've seen. Awesome. Yeah, I've been, the groups that I belong to in different committees been sharing this and, you know, sharing it with school age parents and parents entering children, parents of children entering school as well to give all the options for what will work best for their child. So I guess this is really grassroots of word of mouth and 
Social media has become a new word of mouth. All right. Thanks, committee members, for sharing. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Cheryl. All right. Any other comments on the steering committee's activities from any of our guests? Well, I oh, I see a hand up. Uh, Patty Doyle. I I don't see you, but I saw your hand pop up. You can go ahead and unmute if you have something you'd like to share with us. I was wondering if there was a vehicle in place where people who had online programs they were using or tutors they were using um, could evaluate to share their ideas on how well the programs are working, or if they have put in place a pre-test kind of post-test set for their kiddos um, that they could share. Does that make sense? It, it does, um, and we don't um, have that for this particular um, education savings account community, but I wonder if some of our committee members uh, through some of their groups might have some information to share on that or. I'm looking at things that were probably, you know, um, based for their age, whatever their child's age was, what they were using to evaluate their progress, if those tools are available for them, maybe through the- I think for- public. Go for, ahead. What I was gonna say, for kids with special needs who left with an IEP, I think a lot of the parents are using that and just keeping up with the benchmarking of it and right. moving on to the next set of goals. So it's it's very individualized. I personally really only just work with the families with the IEPs. I know that's what they do, and then they just reassess based on that. Are you wanting to know how to reevaluate a child that's left the system that's in this program to see where they're at? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, I'm just wondering what vehicle the parents would have for evaluating how well the student, their child was doing on those benchmarks. Um, under the child find laws, you can still have your children evaluated by your local school district every three years. You can request full comprehensive evaluations to see where they're at and how they're doing. And that would include um, uh, have an assessment of how they're they're doing and you could compare them over the years so that the parents can still use the public school systems for that you just can't enroll your student but under child find you're still allowed to go to your public schools and say i want my child to be evaluated for services and have those evaluations done my son he's not been enrolled in public schools for four years now and we just had full comprehensive evaluations done and they did iq testing and they did ot testing and speech testing and they were able to determine how he was doing and how he had progressed over the last four years not being in public school and give me all of those results so you can still use the public school for that but any curriculum you're doing when you're teaching your child one-on-one -on -one at home, um, homeschooling is a little bit different. You keep working with the material until the child masters it. Um, same with a tutor. If you're working with a tutor, they're going to keep working with the child until they master the material, and then you'll move on. It's not the same as a public school system where this class keeps going, whether the child or an individual child has mastered it or not. When you're working one on one with a child at home, you're you're going to continue working the material until they master it and then you move on. So you kind of don't need to know how they're doing. and You don't need to test or or gauge where they're at because you you know that they've either mastered it or they're not. You can't move on until they've mastered it. So um, I, I don't know if that answers your question or not. Yeah, I just think possibly be nice for people to be able to share programs and tools they were using. Um, so that if they weren't so adept as it sounds you are at being able to get their child through specifics of those benchmarks as you referred to, could have that. I, 
available it's, to them? <laughs> um, I don't know that I'm adept. I've I've been doing it for four years with my special needs son, and it's all it's kind of a guessing game no matter what. Each child learns differently and you kind of have to adapt to what they learn and how they learn. And and you kind of learn as you go and there's different curriculums out there and, and you kind of have to surround yourself with other parents that are also trying to teach their children at home. And there is a lot of communities in Montana of parents that are teaching their children at home with special needs and without, and you kind of learn and talk to all of them and, and find out what's working and what's not. But when you're one-on-one -on -one with your student, you learn really quick from them. What, what do they learn from? How do they best learn and, and what works for them? And then you kind of find curriculum or a way to teach them that they respond to. It's, it's a very immediate system for you. You, you see what they, what engages them. You see what they respond to and you, you adapt to that. It's, it's, um, it's not like when you're teaching 15 students and you can't look in their faces and you don't have that direct connection and immediate responses. So you you get that when you're just working with your student one on one and there's the support ne network is there. There's there's definitely a lot more support network with other parents that are trying to figure it out just as you are. And there's no right or wrong answers and there's good days and there's bad days, but you, you just keep trying and, and powering through it. That's that's the way homeschooling is all right well thank you for sharing that and thank you for allowing me to ask a question yeah i do just want to note um that there is a clause in you know the law that does release the resident school district from all obligations for to educate the students and to provide that free and appropriate education. So exactly what Catherine was talking about, but I just wanted to kind of um, reiterate that. Um, yes, you can't enroll them, but, <laughs> but you still are eligible for um, those evaluations under the child yeah. fine. Like you can still request those evaluations, but the mm -hmm. school doesn't have to provide services. They don't have to provide all of those, the education part, but you can still get the evaluations done to monitor how your your child is and what they might still need. You're muted. Oh, sorry. I think we're getting ready to wrap up here. Thanks, Whitney. Um, I do see Cheryl, do you, was your hand still up or do you have another question or comment? Yeah, I just have one one other question, um, something that I've been running into a little bit as I've been talking to parents and I was hoping maybe you can clarify and Catherine um, struck my memory on it. Um, when you unenroll your child and you release the school district, I guess it was you, Christy, who struck my memory um, and you release the school district, um, can they still do a, like the part time enrollment through that other avenue of the law and say I still want my child to do PE and art class could you still do the open enrollment piece um, of it not exactly open enrollment no they can't be enrolled at all so if the school has sort of a program that they would for example pay a tuition piece to be part of potentially but they can't be enrolled in the school at all but if there was and, yeah but there's some uh, way that, that there is that piece of the law that said they can be they can there we can reimburse for public school expenses if there were some way that that school had that set up potentially mm -hmm. um that could work so i hope that okay. clarifies a little bit yeah and yeah. then has there been any um anyone who has been able to um fully unenroll from the school and then buy those services through the school. So maybe they're, they were doing speech therapy at the school and then they can buy the, use the ESA money toward that. Has anybody done that? Or is that like, you can't do that? Is that allowed? It, you know, Cheryl, I would have to follow up with our legal counsel and with our OPI special ed, but no, because if they would have to be enrolled to receive those services, then that would not, that wouldn't work, 
right? But so, you wouldn't be receiving it. You would be mm -hmm. buying it from them and like mm -hmm. you'd be using them as a one of your unbundled yeah. services. If you're yeah. in a small rural area, I'm just, mm -hmm. I just want to make sure that as I talk to pa parents that they know, like I'm not sending gotcha. any yeah. weird information. People will yeah, try I'm so sure. hard to <laughs> make it work, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Thanks. well, I would let me circle with our um, with our folks here, our legal department, and um, have them take a quick look at that a little bit more closely. That particular question, I don't know, um, Cheryl, but I just I, they would ha we'd have to take a closer look at that okay. spe specificity. I think, yeah. Thank you, mm -hmm. Chrissy. Um, you might want to ask them because. When a student's unenrolled, they're still eligible for a private placed service plan and schools can still offer speech and OT services under a private place service plan. So yeah, that, like, are they still out. eligible for that? Because technically they still would be eligible for a private place service plan with things like speech and OT because um, they're not enrolled uh, and they shouldn't have to pay for it. Um, but I think that comes to FAPE again, Catherine, for the private, and this is a little bit different than that. So that's why let so me wondering. follow up. Yeah, let me. I, I think it's a whole gray area yeah. that the schools are not going to mm -hmm. want to do because they're already paying for the mm -hmm. kid that they're going to be like, we're already paying. Yeah. So no. Well, and I think that, and I, I would just, I'm going to have, I see Rick, I think is still on the line, but I, yeah, I'm going to have him take a look into that law for right. a little bit more specificity, but I'm inclined to say no, because that, then they would need to be enrolled in the school and a private school is different than withdrawing, right. than, than using the ESA program. That's a different, that like, I see where that works for the private school because the private yeah. school is not for it, but then still through fate, but the contracts, they don't have that anymore. That agreement is gone. And so I don't think so. This is where this is different. Yeah. In all yeah. honesty, though, if you're looking at getting your kids therapy and you're using these dollars, your money is going to be better spent on private therapy than than paying for the school's therapy. Because the, the goals in school's therapy is, is keeping them at um, grade level and for in the school setting and private therapy is is for their whole life. How are we going to better their lives? And um, private therapy is much more aggressive and much more focused and your results are are generally much better. So I would always encourage you to go private therapy over school therapy um, and build a relationship with a private therapist. So if if parents are like trying to choose and you have the option to use ESA money to go private therapy, find a private wow. therapist and, and go that route. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, Cheryl. I hope that kind of answered your question. I think we kind of got around to that a little bit. Um, yeah, and it might be a good opportunity for um, a correction in the law to just to kind of smooth things out and make some clear designations of how they can use it, or if they want to say we can go ahead and use it um, that in that direction or not. Thank you. All right. Well, I think we have come to the end of our time together today. Um, as always, good to see you. Thanks, Whitney, for your information. Thanks, Rick, for, for sharing out. And thank you, committee. We will circle back with you all after the new year. In the meantime, have a, have a safe, wonderful holiday season. We have not had too much snow here, but um, I'm sure it's on the way. And I think some areas have gotten a little more than we have here. Um, but in the meantime, uh, be safe, everyone, and we'll see you next year. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Thank you. Thank you.